retro bulbar and anesthetics um, over over my residency, and of course in my uh, career as well. But uh, like Gisela said, you know, you, you don't get the chance to do it. Uh, there is the a video still playing. What's did still you, playing? Did you? Is your video supposed to be still playing, or is did you? No, I stopped it. Okay. I yeah. stopped it. Thanks. Um, so with the with the subtenons, I'll do a, a a small incision in the infronasal fornix usually, and uh, you pick up. Maybe I'll we'll, we'll show it on a video better so that we can just demonstrate it. Let's get back to the bilingual ring. Uh, if you notice here, I'm holding as close to the limbus as possible to try and uh, induce as little subconjunctival hemorrhage as possible as well. And then I'm using the, the this is a spatulated needle on a 70 silk. Uh, and uh, once again, use the curvature of the needle to try and engage the sclera and then just turn the needle. Um, and you don't have to hold uh, close to, oops, what happened there? Okay. You don't have to hold close to where you're actually inserting the suture. And then you can pull it through and do a uh, 2 one, one throw. Or even a 2-1. Um, now, I like the Goldman speculum better than we talked about last time because the, the Goldman uh, actually pulls the eye up into the field. Whereas uh, this is, I'm, we're using just one of those uh, open, open bladed spring speculums. These don't put too much pressure on the globe, but I do remember uh, last year, one of our, our uh, fellows was doing a very nice uh, case and happened to flick the speculum, which suddenly elevated the pressure on the eye and the intraocular lens went bloop and vitreous uh, came out. Luckily, less than 60% of the zonules were broken. And, but it, it, you know, it, it just happened so suddenly that there was no, there was no recourse to it. So that's the other reason why I don't like the speculum sitting on the outside, particularly the Lieberman, which tends to be longer. All you have to do is inadvertently hit that and uh, you've raised the pressure. So once you get a, a couple of sutures in, you can then hang on to the ring. You don't even have to, you don't have to hold the eye. Um, you know, the 2018 was, was the year where I made the resolution that I was going to try and be as, as tissue friendly as possible. Um, particularly, you know, with cataracts, you, you don't want to have the patient complain that they've got this ugly subconj hemorrhage when their vision's 2020. Uh, but I think also in, in the graphs, the, the, the less you manipulate the eye and the less you uh, engage the blood vessels, the, the, uh, the better it looks, but I think it's also um, better for the, the eye as well. And um, so <clears throat> Marguerite McDonald used to tell us that when you're putting in these sutures, you should actually go the other way from uh, towards the limbus rather than away from the limbus because um, if it's in a particular if it's in a phacic patient you may end up uh, dinging the lens. Um, I've never seen that happen but um, so you know here we're going the other way just because it's more convenient but from at least according to Marguerite's rules and she was she's she's a pretty good surgeon so uh, I would take it at uh, some value. And then while the fellow is putting on the ring, I'm uh, measuring the, the cornea to see um, what size graft we should do. I was wondering um, if you could, well, I, something that I learned from you that I just wanted to share with uh, mm -hmm. Ayala and uh, Michael is that sometimes you do the trephination before you put the ring on. Right, and that that I think just make sure that your trephine will not get in like that. Sorry, that your ring is not going to get in the way of your trephine because sometimes after you place the fluoringa ring, then you cannot fit 
the trephine if it's of the, the big ones and it, it makes the trephination harder. And if you have the trephination already done, uh, you can actually manipulate the edge of the cornea instead of touching the sclera. And that's something that you taught me to, to also reduce the risk of uh, subconscious hemorrhages. And I think it's very easy to manipulate the, the eye from that little like rim of cornea after you've trephanated. Right, that's a that's a good point, and that that also points to the uh, the two different kinds of tree finds that that we use um, at the Western. We use the the Moria tree find, uh, which actually gives you perilimbal suction. It's it's it, it sucks on in this region here, and if and Gisela is quite correct. If you if you put the ring on first. You might have some hemorrhages, or you may have the ring decentered, which will then force your tree find to uh, be decentered as well. And so, uh, yeah, we'll do a partial thickness trephination and then sew the ring on. But by and large, uh, I much prefer the uh, the Goldman speculum. If you're going to use the phylingra, sometimes it's good to put in a, a rectus suture, an inferior rectus, and a superior rectus suture, and then you can tape that to the drape and, and you'll get a similar effect of, of elevating the globe plus uh, folding the, the eyelids uh, open a little bit farther. So, uh, you know, at the Western, uh, using the Moria tree fine, it's, uh, it's better to tree, tree fine first. If you're at KEI, we use the uh, Hesper Baron tree fines, which are smaller and they actually give you corneal suction, which has the advantage that, that there's no centration problem and it, it'll go into a smaller uh, aperture, lid aperture. Um, the, and this, this was obviously photographed at KEI. Um, so the, if you're using that, then then you, it doesn't matter if you sew the ring on before or after. But uh, like Gisela pointed out, is if, if you've done a partial thickness trephination, then you can grab the edge of the keratotomy uh, with, you can either even grab it on the, the uh, recipient side, because that tissue is coming out anyhow. So if you damage it, it's no, no biggie. If you grab on the, the uh, donor side and you happen to rip it, um, of course, we shouldn't be grabbing it, grasping. I don't like the word grabbing. We don't grab in ophthalmology, we grasp. Um, if you grasp too firmly, you, you may tear the tissue and then uh, you'll, you'll kick yourself. Um, so this is a, a done at, at KEI. You can see it's the Hesperic bearing tree fine. And uh, it, this, the, these ones are nice because they've got these uh, 16 marks, uh, although we don't often take advantage of those marks, but it gives you uh, your suture orientation that's definitely concentric with your cut. And there's three uh, vertical uh, pieces of metal, round pieces of metal. There's the outer one that sucks on onto the or that touches the cornea. And then there's a, a space and then there's an inner one, which I'm having difficulty. Oh yeah, it must be right here behind the blade. Let's uh, move the video and see what happens. How do you actually get the outer little 16 marks to mark? Because I've literally never seen anyone get ink on those bits to mark the cornea. Uh, you, uh, you just have to be mindful and you'll see when after the trepanation here, I believe on this video it demonstrates it, but uh, if, if you look and you dry off the cornea or sometimes if there's a few drops of blood, you'll see them settle into these, uh, these square impressions. So it's uh, an indentation, it's not an inking then? You if you want to, you could ink it prior but then if you twist your tree fly, then you're going to have a real mess. So uh, I, I think it's, it's better to, to do it after. And so what, I'm, what you'll notice here is we're holding the phylingra ring and we're making the iris parallel to the floor, parallel to the ceiling. And we're trying to look straight down the barrel 
so that uh, we avoid uh, parallax, uh, doing everything possible to try and get good anatomical centration. Um, there was a, a paper written many years ago by uh, Leo McGuire, uh, and he compared uh, pupil-centric versus uh, anatomic-centric. And uh, actually, I don't even remember what his results uh, showed, but uh, I think it, you're better off being concentric with with the uh, limbus rather than uh, doing it on the pupil because that could leave you with a decentered graft, which is uh, a no-no if you can avoid it. So uh, the camera, I don't think is going, it might not be the same view that the surgeon has, because you can see the X on the uh, tree fine is a little bit, bit off, or maybe we're just trying to center it a little bit um, better. We didn't like the centration mark. So we're using this as our reference point and say, okay, well, we've got to go a little bit up into the left or a little bit down into the right in order to get it uh, centered. And then you re release the suction and allow it to sit on the cornea for 10 or 15 seconds. And <clears throat> prior to putting it on the cornea, you reverse it three quarter turns so that the blade is retracted a little bit. Otherwise the suction may be incomplete. And here we've gone down uh, tree find until uh, entry, which is quite acceptable in most circumstances, unless you've got uh, an iris stuck up against the cornea. Generally, we like to do uh, near complete trepanation. And then this is uh, myocol is instilled, uh, bring the pupil down. And uh, this patient has had a graft I'm not sure that I can't remember the reason why in, in this particular case has had a graft and a cataract done. You can see the reflection of the intraocular lens there. And we'll fill up the chamber with viscoelastic and uh, on this player, I don't know how you make it go fast forward. Uh, so if you go up to VLC at the top, um, it will have a playback feature. And if you press on that, you can um, just dial oh, yeah. it as fast as you want. Okay, well, let's dial it up a little faster so that we can always Sorry stop. that I'm on call. Sorry that I left. The, I'm on call. And um, yeah. up, there's a perforation. So I'm just oh. going to try to arrange for an OR. It's an old PKP. It's been like this for two weeks. Uh, the patient had trauma and now the graft is like, they just, I mean, the patient didn't come to the emergency right away. And now, well, that's when she came today and the corn, the graft is completely lost. So I'm just- It's completely lost? Like, oh, the gra it's gone, you mean, or it's a- As you know, like it's open, but uh, I mean, he wasn't yes. sure. <laughs> he was telling me he couldn't see exactly where the edges of the graft were. So I guess we have to order cornea and everything. So that's why I left. Who's, yeah. who's patient? Is it, uh, it's not ours. It's not from the ours. Western. He told me a different name of a cornea specialist that did the transplant years ago. Oh, okay. um, and it's like a NLPI from before the trauma. So I oh. guess it's not really urgent. It's been open for two weeks, but... Um, I'm just going to try to arrange for that with the resident. Okay, great. If you need my help, let me know. Um, okay. I, you'll probably be okay without me, but um, I'm available. We, we could do a FaceTime in the OR <laughs> technology. <laughs> We're being uh, accelerated in our adapt adaptations. Um, so uh, let's get back to, to this case here. Uh, you can see that this graft before was a, it was a pretty small graft and it was uh, somewhat eccentric. So it was, it was probably done a long time ago. People used to do pretty small grafts, you know, six and a half, seven millimeters. And of course, on a keratoconus patient, that often left them with a lot of irregular astigmatism. But uh, nonetheless, so uh, <clears throat> let's just talk a bit about if there's been a previous graft, what do you do? Uh, some people will cut around the old graft, they'll, they'll, 
you know, go to go into the wound margin. What, what my general rule of thumb is that if it's under a year, you can just sort of, uh, you can take two forceps and you can peel it apart and then you can uh, sort of, I, I, what's a better word for rip? But anyhow, you can sort of do, do like, say it again. Tear, separate. Tear, okay, separate, separate. That's a better word. Yeah. To, you have to use uh, the proper lingo. Uh, yeah, well, you just you can just separate it fairly easily if it's if it's less than one year. Uh, if it's more than one year, then just uh, ignore the old graft and uh, do your centration and and tree fine as as you normally would. Um, here, because we penetrated down here, we're going to utilize that space. Um, I like to start at. Uh, at the 10 o'clock position and usually go down to about the eight o'clock position with, with the blade. But let's watch and see if the surgeon um, observes all the things we, we talked about yesterday. This is the way uh, Marguerite McDonald used to, used to cut. You can see how you just put the, the, the lower blade uh, inside the eye. And what, what's, uh, what's he doing that I don't really like that much? Uh, well, he's ergonomically, it's not great. Um, he clearly wasn't in kindergarten. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he failed kindergarten. <laughs> so, interestingly, uh, he's using the flaringa ring to um, stabilize rather than actually holding on to the tissue, which mm -hmm. I don't always do. You don't what? Which I think I it's a. I, I think that's a good way to do yeah, it. I think so too. Because uh, you, you're not going to cause any uh, tissue damage by doing yeah. that. And um, you'll notice here that he's actually obstructing his view with the forceps. Yeah. Can't see, you can't see what he, where the scissors are going. So it's better to grasp it a little farther along like that. And uh, then you can, uh, just like we talked in the OR about when you do DALC is you lift up the um, lift up the edge and you put your scissors on on like this so that it's going past the, the, the edge and then you slide them down yeah uh, into the keratotomy so instead of sticking them in and going snip and then sticking them in again snip which gives you <coughs> Uh, infinite chances to perforate with your scissors, which which doesn't earn you extra points and doesn't make you feel very good. Prof, can you just hang on for two seconds? Sorry, I, Giselle. I can. It's Giselle. It's easy for me to talk to you. Um, so there is only probably emergency tissue. The patient okay. needs to have been swabbed for COVID, and uh -huh. the tissue you need to the tissue the patient has to be consented that the tissue there's no way that we can test the tissue for COVID so they have to be consented for possibility of COVID transmission although it's probably theoretically low. I don't think we have optical grade tissue. I think there's only tectonic grade tissue available. So why don't you just sew the old graph shut? That's you, yeah, that's what I'm thinking that you may have to do once you have a look. But um, you need to contact Clara because they're only on skeleton staff. But that's what happened with ALs. Uh, perforation it took us like three days to organize wow wow, wow. so because what, what, take a look at the patient if the tissue is still there did he have is that, he that the, it was a retina fellow is that the 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 patient got referred to them for a vitreous hemorrhage and when he goes to see it's a perforation so he wasn't sure if the graft was there or not so i'm like uh i guess we can just suture the old one but if it's completely lost then we have to get a tectonic Right, you could get a one, maybe that's uh, preserved in alcohol if it's just for tectonic purposes. If they have one, um, that's that's another option. Now, <clears throat> I've only once seen a case where the graft was completely gone, uh, that and that was about twenty five years ago. That I remember the, the the guy had been to New York and had had uh, graphs done by, um, what's his name, um, Richard, and it'll come to me in a minute, your famous uh, New York surgeon, uh, Park Avenue Park? surgeon. Hmm? Parks? No, 
No, the Marshall Parks is, is a, he was a uh, pediatric strabismus Richard, in Washington. Richard, Richard Parks? Is there? No. no. Mm, it's a good, good try. Uh, it'll come to me. At any rate, he, he gave his practice up to uh, Sandra Belmont uh, eventually. Um, I think he, I believe he's still alive. I saw him at one of the meetings a couple of years ago. They gave him a medal or honorarium of some of some sort. At any rate, he'd had he'd gone to New York and had uh, transplants done for keratoconus. And the story that that I got from the referring ophthalmologist in the Niagara region is that he'd been at his cottage and went into town and went to have a drink at the bar or whatever and. Uh, someone accosted him, punched him in the eye, and the, the ophthalmologist took him to the operating room, and he said he tried to sew the graft, uh, he tried to sew it back together again, and he couldn't, so he asked me if I would see him, and when he came in, uh, there was no graft, there was no iris, there was no lens, and there was vitreous on the cheek. And the the only suture that I could see was a little figure of eight. It looked like a cat gut suture. That so you know people sometimes have difficulty interpreting what they're seeing. I guess, uh, but uh, he gave it a good. At least he brought it to the OR to investigate what was going on. And uh, so that's the only time. Usually, what happens is they get punched in the eye, and the wound opens up. Uh, and they can lose iris and they can lose lens and they can lose a pseudophacos, but uh, generally the, the, it opens up for about 180 degrees and uh, you can just then sew the graft back together. The, the end story with that guy, I haven't seen him in, in quite a while now, but um, when they lose their iris, they're at very high risk of developing glaucoma. I think the, the angle uh, ends up being dysfunctional. Probably they lose the endothelium covering the uh, trabecular meshwork as well. And so initially their pressure may be okay, but uh, with time it, it uh, generally climbs and they get glaucoma. Um, but so that was, uh, that's the only time that I've seen a graft evolve. And, and thank goodness we're doing less grafts because it's it's devastating, you know. All we've got is a little scar holding that graft together. I have one one patient whose son is a liver transplant surgeon at the at the general, and she had bilateral Fuchs dystrophy, and had nice grafts done, and um, um, and you know cataract at the same time, and was doing well. And then she was in the bathtub, and she leaned forward to turn off the water and guess what engaged her eye, you know, the, the spigot coming out from the wall. Uh, she, she banged it directly with that and ended up losing the lens. Um, we ended up putting a lens back in and sewing the cornea, putting a new cornea. No, I think we just used the same one and she did okay. But uh, it's, I can just think back over the years of all the patients that have done poorly in, in that circumstance. At any rate, uh, let's get back to our case here. So we've got the bilingual ring. Now we've got a nice uh, cut and you, you can see there's no edges that you have to go and uh, trim. And you can then pick up the donor with, with the spatula. I like to bring the whole thing across rather than scooping it onto the, you know, being over here, you scoop it on, onto the spatula. And even though you bring your hand across, um, I've never draw, I've never seen one dropped in that circumstance. I think I've dropped one on the floor once. And once doing a DMEC, um, we had the gooder tube on and it wasn't on tight enough and it fell off and landed on the floor and uh, so we had to prepare a new donor. Um, but it will happen uh, one, once in a while. So it, I think it's better to transfer the whole thing across and then pick it up with the spatula. And then you can turn it over uh, like so and uh, just place it 
onto a bed of Helon and uh, allow it to uh, find its place. Uh, the nice thing about this is you, you can notice that the, the circle that uh, was cut by the tree fine has remained round, which means that the ring has been applied with minimal tension, enough to support the sclera, but not so much that uh, it distorts, uh, distorts the eye. And uh, is this uh, better with the VLC player rather than QuickTime? It's less, yeah. it's still jumpy, but less jumpy. Less jumpy, okay, well, that's good. Yeah, well, right now it's on, on high speed. It's on high speed, so uh, I can slow it down and we'll see if it's any better. Uh, on my side, it's better. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good to know. Let's see if we put it on normal playback speed, if it's, um, if that gets rid of some of the jumpiness. You see how that, that, that improves it. And uh, you'll notice that whoever was doing this um, what was I going to tell you? I forgot now. Okay. Cardinals, open sky. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I was going to say is that you don't really, you shouldn't need to lock your first suture because uh, mm -hmm. there's absolutely no tension on it. So uh, if you lock it, it's going to end up being tight. And, and typically, I think it's okay if your first eight sutures are, are tight, a little bit tighter than, than usual, and be mindful of that. And when you're taking out the sutures, you know, usually we'll let the graft heal for at least four to six months, and then I'll often take out half of the sutures. Take out the, the first eight that you put in, because they're likely to be the most distorted and the tightest ones. And then your, your second row sutures may uh, relax a little bit more and allow the cornea to, to take on a more normal uh, configuration. And let's see if, if we like the way that, that the suturing was done here. There's Sorry, a, Prof, I didn't, I didn't understand what you were saying about the fact that they locked the, the first suture. Well, you, usually, you only need to lock a suture if the tissue's under a lot of tension and you need to pull it together really tight. And when you've got a, when you, when you don't, when you've got an open sky like that and you're just putting in your first suture, there's no tension on it. So if you do lock it, you're going to end up making it tighter than, than necessary. Does that make sense? Did I explain that? Uh, Yes, completely. I, you're referring to the maneuver where he kind of dragged it to the towards the center of the cornea to lock it after he threw it in. That right. first bite. Okay, thank you. Right. And you know this technique's pretty good here. So he's keeping the needle holder parallel to the wound. I like to extend it beyond the the suture pass, and uh, then when you wrap it doesn't fall off the needle holder as, as readily. And I like you to um, always pull in the direction of the suture because when you pull at, at right angles to it, you're actually causing a lot of friction on the two suture pieces and that can actually cut through your suture. And uh, you, you'll see that quite frequently with, when people um, go at right angles the, that they cut their suture. And maybe we'll speed this up a little bit again. It'll accentuate the coffee tremor. I, I, uh, I never, I used to not drink coffee on the day of surgery. That's about 10 years ago, I guess I started to, uh, but I definitely notice it on my first case of the day that, that uh, I've got a, got a little bit of a micro tremor. And he's observing the, the rule of staying uh, parallel to the wound. And uh, now the right hand should not move very much. It's mostly the left hand. And that was, that's pretty good. All right. So maybe we'll scrub ahead on this a little bit and see.
And that, it's, it's really not necessary to bridge the suture the way that, that uh, was done just over here. Um, right. What do you mean by bridge the suture? Uh, using your forceps to help you push it through. Just watch this on the, on the recipient side. Just, just continue to hold it with your point one two. That, that's what I mean by bridging, We're putting pressure on the exit point. Um, it's better to hold on to the edge of the tissue and use your needle to to pass the suture. When you put counter pressure on the outside, you'll change the trajectory of your needle and you'll end up um, either too short or too long. Now there may be occasions where it's necessary to do that, but in general, these needles are super sharp. And uh, if you don't mess with the needle too much, it should be just as sharp after you've done 16 passes as it was when, when you did your, uh, after your 16th pass, it should be just as sharp as when you did your first pass. And I, I like it, the technique here is sort of turning the edge out and then um, there you see, you don't really need to, to put any counter pressure on the outside and just use the curvature of the needle. And I think if you follow those principles of always trying to keep your needle holder uh, parallel to the wound, you'll find that it's much more natural and uh, much more efficient. Okay. Excuse me. Question there? Yes, you. Excuse Bless me. you. Bless you. Okay. Now, uh, yesterday we did we looked at, uh, oops. Okay, so here's uh, the subtenon block. You take a good grasp of the conjunctiva and uh, try and get down to sclera as, uh, as quickly as you can. And then this is using, this is done at KEI as well. We've got uh, dedicated uh, subtenons uh, needles or cannulas, and they, they work very well. Now, uh, the thing I didn't like about the way that subtenons was done was that I like to go more parallel to the, um, the sagittal plane. So if you draw a line down the forehead and down the nose, um, you, you want to have your cannula going in parallel to that line and then once and try and feel that you're going along the sclera and once you get behind the eye the needle or the, the syringe should be almost vertical and uh, if you do that it'll it should slide uh, nicely into the uh, retrobulbar space uh, what we're trying to do is to get of course, a retrobulbar block and try and have as little uh, chemosis as possible. You can see there's a little bit here. And when I do a subtenons, then um, I try not to massage too vigorously because that may cause the anesthetic that's in the subtenon space to come forward. This is uh, Randall's maneuver of placing a... Prof, I deeply apologize. I didn't understand the... Explan I mean, you explained it perfectly. It's my bad. I didn't understand the that explanation about sagittal, et cetera. I didn't get that point. Sorry. The, which part didn't you get? About, about the direction of entry, I believe. Um, yeah, the, the, the needle, the, the, the scissors when you're separating initially should be parallel to the, the sagittal plane, not towards the nose. If you go more towards the nose, I think you get involved with the tenons and stuff around the inferior oblique. But if you go sort of parallel to the, in between the medial rectus and the inferior rectus, and you go parallel to the inferior rectus, there seems to be a sweet spot there. And uh, if you hit that sweet spot, then when you slide your cannula, the eye will not move. You know, whereas if you're engaged in tenons, the eye will go down when you try and get push the needle posteriorly. Does that make more sense? 
Yes, thank you. Okay. So, um, here we're just doing a little massage. Oh yeah, this is Randall's maneuver with the uh, wet cell on top of the uh, area where, where we've done the injection. And then I like to use a uh, tegaderm. It's a nice, thin, pliable membrane and um, we try and get the eyelashes out of the way as much as possible. And then here, we're, it's a little jumpy there, probably because it's coming off of a uh, hard drive. And we're measuring, deciding on the size of the tree fine. So you see, it's a, this is a fairly small eye. So we prob probably only go there about a, two, I'm showing a seven there or 7.25, 7.5. And I like to demonstrate on the cornea uh, roughly how large it's going to be. And here's the, the eight marks that we just eyeball it, and nine marks, including the, the one in, in the center. And uh, applying the tree fine. It's, there's the traf there's the marks. Yeah. So if you um, do if they hang around? Pardon? Do they hang around? Like they're there now, but not for very I, long. Okay, because I was going to say by the time I get to suturing, I don't know if I've always noticed them. Yeah, they're gone by then. Yeah. Um, but if you, what you can do is then uh, take a, a pen yeah, and mark it. Yeah. Now uh, this this video is upside down to what we're usually used to seeing. The surgeon is uh, sitting at the top, and what I'm trying to do is uh, do a closed uh, sky phaco. So uh, we're dissecting, we're taking off the cornea. You get to practice our lamellar dissection skills here. I like to lift up, grasp the cornea and, and lift it up quite firmly. You don't pull downwards, but lift actually sort of straight up a little bit downwards. And then often you'll see that, that little white line forming and you can very uh, efficiently <laughs> remove the uh, anterior lamella. We still don't have a great view I don't know. In my, I guess it was good enough to do the cataract as we're proceeding. And if you fill in the opening with uh, viscoelastic and let that kind of settle, then uh, you'll be able to see through there a lot better. Mm. Vision, some vision blue got on the surface, and sometimes that can uh, stain things as well stain your stroma. But the very white cataract, looks fairly mature as well. And then here we're, we're entering you know, through the keratotomy and uh, making an attempt at capsular excess. The view's not, not the best. So it, it, it seems almost fibrotic. You know? Looks like you know, that's just viscoelastic coming out. And these are actually the Castro Viejo scissors that uh, for some reason I'm using. Either they're the Castros or they're the um, the Fogla scissors. Maybe they're the Fogla ones. So you can see how fib fibrotic that uh, 
how fibrotic that capsule is. Are there instances where you do prefer to use the Castroviejo scissors? Uh, I like them for dissecting and delve. Mm -hmm. um, but generally, if you've got cornea scissors to the right and the left, I think it's, yeah. it's easier to get a, a vertical uh, cut. Just thinking yeah. about like when I go back, when I put together my set, mm -hmm. what I prioritize in terms of instrumentation. Right. They may have a lot of stuff already. It's, uh, if you've had corneal surgeons that are there yeah, already. I, but... It's just things that I really like. Like I really like the right and left corneal scissors over the cast or over the other corneal scissors that like seem to be a bit generic. Yeah, so um, that, to get the, this lens out, it's fairly large, but you can inject some viscoelastic along the um, you know, the hydro section plane and don't do it really forcefully, but often that's, that's enough to, to uh, start the lens, uh, start the egress of the lens without having to put too much pressure on, on the outside like you would do when you're doing an extra cap. And um, you can use the IA tip to wash out. It's, it's almost here. In this case, the, the lens was so dense that uh, we're just washing out the, the hard uh, cortical uh, pieces. And actually, I think the safer way to do it is using a Simcoe needle. Do you, anyone use a Simcoe needle with um, with cataract extraction to, when you're doing manual extra caps? And manuals, yeah. I learned how to use it because we had to go to some hospitals that did not have a FACO machine. Yeah. So, uh -huh. yeah. It's actually the safest way to take out cortex, if you ask me. It's so controlled, you know, you do with the 10 cc syringe and you're controlling the vacuum. And it's also very good in triple procedures because it's a very gentle way to wash out the cortex. But just a point of, of reference with that case, if, <clears throat> if things are starting to bulge, just leave the cortex, put in some viscoelastic and close it up. And once you've got um, you know, six or eight sutures in, then you can go back and, and remove the cortex providing your uh, cornea is clear enough. Um, and often the graft tissue is clear. Okay, anyhow, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna uh, wrap it up for today because I've got a 10.30 meeting okay. as well. Okay. And we could do this, uh, we were gonna do it Wednesday and Friday at, at 10 o'clock.